Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Greg Armstrong. I am head of a program here at CDC, something called uh, Advanced Molecular Detection, or uh, AMD. It's a, a program mostly to bring in um, next generation sequencing and uh, bioinformatics into public health. But um, I'd like to go ahead and get started this morning. The, our first uh, speaker of the day is uh, Gao Feng Chong from uh, uh, New Hampshire Department of Health. Good afternoon. Um, in 2012, there is a, an outbreak of Hep C in the state of New Hampshire in a local hospital. So in the next 10 minutes, I will be talking about um, our laboratory capacity prior to the outbreak, during the outbreak, and uh, the improvement after the outbreak. So on um, May 15th, 2012, a, a local hospital notified the State Department of Health of a potential hep C outbreak associated with the hospital's cardiac catheterization laboratory. Basically, three patients who um, had a procedure in the CCL were diagnosed with hep C and one CCL employee was also diagnosed with Hep C. So right after we received the report, our EPI contacted the lab, and we were asked some questions. So the questions were, what was the state public health lab capacity for Hep C testing, and could the state public health lab determine if these cases were related, and what strategy would be used and what to do if the state lab could not determine if these cases were related or not. There's a table here. So first question, laboratory capacity. Um, we implemented both anti-HCV antibody test and HCV RNA test in 2001. Prior to the outbreak, we tested we um, used both tests over 10 years uh, for routine hep C testing. And in 2010, we um, developed and validated five primary UTR sequencing for hep C genotyping. So this is the data over 10 years between 2002 and 2011. Um, we, over the 10 years, we test about 1,000 specimens per year. And the uh, positive rate for anti-HCV antibody, anti antibody was 31%. And of the EIA positive samples, PCR positive rate was 76%. Then strategy. For the question number two, whether the state lab is able to determine what, you know, that. Uh, um, if the four cases were related, my, my, my answer to our EPI was maybe or may not. So then third question, what strategy will be used that uh, we decided to, to use sequencing of NS5B region and HVR1 region? Uh, NS5B for HCV subtyping and HVR1 for genetic relentness. And we developed our testing algorithm and also we um, uh, prepared testing procedure because we routinely perform uh, five prime UTR region sequencing, so that made us easier to um, utilize five prime, uh, NS5B and HVR1 region sequencing for the outbreak investigation. And then we um, use that uh, PCR and sequencing for the first four specimens and uh, report sequencing results to our EPI. Because this is for uh, outbreak investiga investigation purpose, we do not report sequence data to our providers. So when we, we understood that it would take time to order primer and receive primer, that we, in order to respond to the outbreak as soon as possible, we um, ordered primer next day. This is the timeline of our lab's initial response. Um, May 15th, we received the report. And we ordered primer on the second day, 
It took six days to get the primer, and in two days, we um, determined that all the first three cases shared identical HR1 sequences. And then on May 25th, the CCL was closed. And uh, on fifth, um, May 26th, we identified that healthcare worker um, um, had the identical sequence, sequences, sequence with, with the other three. So with that confirmation of the outbreak, our state Department of Health recommend Hep C testing for all patients who received services at the uh, CCL um, between August 1st, 2011 to May 25th, 2012 for Hep C testing. So then this is one of our Hep C testing algorithm. Um, Investigation went on. Uh, we, we used multiple um, testing algorithms depending on the situation. So I'm not going to um, go detail about the algorithm. So this is a, um, a number of test samples we, we tested in 2012 that you can see two peaks. First one is in June. That is right after the confirmation of the outbreak that uh, we um, test all the patients who received the services at the CCL. That's about um, 1,300 um, patients. Then when the, uh, the investigation went on, we identified some cases had exposure earlier. So then we pushed back um, the, um, the, 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 um, the patient uh, to, to even earlier date. Eventually, for all the patients who received the care or services between October 1st, 2010 to May 25th, 2012 uh, for Hep C testing. Um, then the second peak in August, that because we uh, IPF, epidemiology uh, investigation found out that the, the this CCL healthcare worker either stayed or worked in the main operation room and ICU so that our investigation expanded to all the patients who received the care during that time frame in ICU and the operation room. So that uh, um, um, over 2,700 patients tested in that time period. So this is shows the data for uh, Hep C testing from between 2002 to 2016. You can see a big peak in 2015 12, that we test over 5,000 specimens in that year. And this is a phylogenetic analysis of HVR1, so that you see uh, the big cluster um, this, from the uh, cases associated with the outbreak. In summary, this outbreak occurred in the hospital's cardiac catheterization lab. Um, hep C transmission was through drug diversion by a CCL technician, and this technician was sentenced 39 years in prison. And over 4,000 samples tested for Hep C in three months. Uh, 32 cases, in addition to, to that healthcare worker, um, were identified associated with outbreak in, in, in H. And this uh, was a multiple state Hep C outbreak. outbreak. Prior to working in New Hampshire, this technician worked in other seven states, and we identified a few cases for Kansas, and also some cases identified in Maryland. So collaboration between uh, our lab and, and the CDC, um, CDC um, laboratory branch did tremendous work for, for, for us. Um, I, um, because 10 minutes, I am not able to talk that much. Yeah, so after the um, outbreak investigation, we did the uh, um, hot wash and uh, after action report, we focused on um, the limitations and the barriers. Basically, we um, utilized the direct sequencing of HVR1 and SFB for the outbreak, but that has limitation. It's not, sometimes we may not be able to detect uh, co-infection with multiple genotypes or subtypes, or for, can, uh, may not be able to detect um, outbreak strain when the outbreak occurred some time, long time ago. And also PCR activity, in 2012, we used Roche uh, Cobas AmpliCore 
So we learned that uh, the uh, ROD for that method was 50 to 100 international unit per ml. Um, and uh, TechMan quantitative test is, is 15 to 30. So our health of official made the decision to send all specimens indicated for PCR to CDC lab for PCR test, RNA test. Uh, so then barriers, uh, we have a specimen uh, receiving, uh, because so many specimens come, come in, came in. So uh, data entry, you know, we have, we had the limited number of computers and staff for data entry, that, 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 that was a barrier. So then, um, uh, we, 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 we try to improve our testing capacity for pre-analytical. Uh, we, this year, we received a ERC grant from CDC uh, for re-establish our laboratory courier for specimen transport. And uh, we had uh, two laboratory specimen receiving areas. We just did consolidation. Analytical, we um, replaced uh, Cobos Amplicore with TechMan. Uh, recently, and uh, we purchased MySeq for ne uh, next generation sequencing. We have used we have used that for uh, whole genome sequencing for post net tract pathogens, and hopefully we, we, we will be using that for um, Hep C next generation sequencing. In the post uh, post analytical, uh, we continue to um, tr um, provide the training. Uh, uh, for LIMS web portal that uh, will enable our users to enter their data or receive their report electronically. And we revised Hep C testing final report. Uh, so collaboration, we, um, uh, after, the, after the outbreak, we started testing um, HCV RNA for our local health department in New Hampshire. Uh, so they will perform rapid test and for anybody positive specimens in our, to our lab for confirmation, uh, for flex test. And I have the testing for other states uh, this morning, I made the comment, uh, we talked to uh, several states um, so that uh, uh, to, to share the, uh, the services. I'm not, uh, I do not against the lawyers, but uh, with state, you know, have different law regulations, it's really hard to, to have a written agreement for share, sharing services. Uh, so then, um, APHL, CDC, um, so we, we, we apply, sub, um, submit our application for GHOST project. Uh, I'm hoping that you will consider the information I'm presenting here. <laughs> um, thank you so much for attention. Thanks. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Uh, yes. Can you explain a little bit more about the healthcare worker and his actions that led to the outbreak? I mean, um, the, the, the health worker was, was an injection drug user. So he worked in, in that CCL. And during our inv investigation, so we found out that uh, he had uh, um, unnormal behavior. Um, and uh, the other employee reported that uh, behavior to the supervisor, but the supervisor ignored that, uh, that, that report. So um, there was one time that, uh, um, um, that the health worker, worker in, the, in the CCL room and uh, just uh, um, fall down, paled, and then he, after a few seconds, he went to the bathroom, you know, did the injection. So that, that, that after, um, after that, when we, did, when we did the investigation, um, other employees reported to our State Department of Health. Yeah. And also that person, um, um, his girlfriend also worked in, in the CCL. And uh, for the procedure uh, of the CCL, that when one person did um, all, you know, that uh, process of uh, fentanyl, uh, must have another person to, to witness. And uh, sometimes they work, to get, they work together. And other employees also reported to the, to the supervisor, but, uh, you know, that, that they didn't solve the problem until um, the investigation. 
Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, <laughs> this uh, example actually um, sets, a, sets a stage for the next set of talks. Um, the first one by uh, Lilia Ganova Reva. Uh, on next generation sequencing technology, the technology that uh, makes this um, system, the ghost system, uh, feasible. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am not going to go in very great detail about next generation sequencing. I am going to try and explain how and why we use it for HCV surveillance and outbreak investigation, hopefully uh, doing a nice um, opening to the, for the next talk. Uh, and I represent the Division of Viral Hepatitis here at uh, CDC. The first thing we need to remember about hepatitis C virus is it has very great genetic heterogeneity. In infected hosts, HCV exists as a large population of closely related but distinct variants, which we call quasi-species. Uh, genetic heterogeneity is distributed unevenly along the HCV genome. Uh, the conserved region, UTR and core, are used typically for detection of the virus by um, that. The hypervariable region of the envelope is, is uh, where most of the quasi-species are discerned, and it's used for epidemiology and evolution uh, evaluation of the virus. Uh, another region used for uh, that evaluation is the NS5A, and most informative region for gene typing is NS5B. In this talk, I'm going to focus on use of HVR1 to sample inter-host and inter-host HCV variants from infected individuals for the purposes of outbreak investigation. To further announce what great genetic heterogeneity HCV has, I wanted to um, show that phylogenetic tree from a recent publication illustrating the most current updates on um, the virus of um, phylogeny. It has seven genotypes and 64 different subtypes. So uh, what happens with the virus in the host? And this is now a, a not a phylogenetic tree. This is a network of viral quasi-species that we have isolated from one particular host. Uh, the dot actually represents one sequence, one distinct haplotype. And the size of the dot represents the frequency of that haplotype in the virus. Uh, what I'm going to show you here in quick uh, succession is uh, how the virus actually explores and changes in the genetic space in that one individual with time. Uh, and sampling has been done uh, in this particular case over 18 years. So to, to see that indeed the virus heterogeneity represents a unique temporal fingerprint of the virus, and every new time point gets a new color. So the, the, the virus, the viral heterogeneity is great, and it's moving along. And one more point, actually, that I want to make is that when you look at a particular time point, if you only um, use consensus sequence to evaluate the genetic signature, Actually, it may not even be found in one of the um, uh, real quasi-species that exist. So the, the consensus sequence does not truly represent the genetic makeup of the uh, virus in the person. So this is an example of inter-host relationship of quasi-species. And this example is to illustrate uh, with one of the recent outbreaks that we investigated, how important it is to actually query the viral quasi-species uh, and to query them accurately. So in this uh, also quick succession of slides, you would see in that network of quasi-species that is actually the source of the uh, outbreak, here shown in yellow. And the individual cases, which were all linked to, to that source. Again, 
to reiterate that if we were to use consensus sequences, the majority of those links would have been lost. They were only became av available to us because of the fine genetic resolution that HVR1 sequencing provided. And in this particular example, the, what was shown here was 18 uh, patients, 18 cases, 23,000 sequences, and uh, 1,000 of which were shared, actually, between the different cases. Now, uh, how do we want to use next generation sequencing for HCV? Next generation is well established technology for acquisition of vast amounts of nucleic acid sequence data at very low cost and high throughput. It's actually the perfect applications to detect low frequency variants, rare mutations, adds great value to clinical diagnostics. I want to reiterate, though, that most applications of next generation sequencing have been developed to work with high complexity samples, such as eukaryotic or, or bacterial genomes, or multiplexing of uh, different multiple loci. Um, working with viruses is a unique application for next generation sequencing. It is, it seems to be the perfect technology for deep sampling of viral heterogeneity, but when combined with the need of high accuracy, especially when um, uh, investigation, outbreak investigations are concerned that where accuracy is paramount, Amplicon surveillance of HCV presents unique challenges that need to be accommodated. And we have aimed to provide a solid framework how to use NGS for accurate determination of quasi-species. So we, we, we had two options, actually, for, um, that we can use on, on a NGS platform. We can either do whole genome sequencing or amplicon sequencing. The difference here is that the amplicon sequencing, and I'm going to read um, through all of this for brevity, but the amplicon sequencing actually gives us a unique fingerprint of the virus because we are able to distinguish between all the variants in their entirety and uh, assess the heterogeneity of the region. While with whole genome sequencing, number one, uh, we, we cannot actually assemble individual quasi-species because of the read length that the next generation um, chemistry provides. And with uh, consensus sequence alone, we, we won't be able to reach the same conclusions as with the detailed fingerprint here. So we, we chose to work with amplicon sequencing. Oh, and, and of course, another uh, consideration here is reduction of cost per specimen, because when you use amplicons, you can multiplex many more uh, samples at the same time. I, for, for those who... Um, are maybe not very familiar with next generation sequencing technology, especially Illumina that we're discussing here. I want to remind that this is um, uh, sequencing by synthesis where the PCR uh, clustering, where PCR clustering happens on initially on the, on a, the chip. So the individual molecules are not separated by any other means except for the oligos that are on the chip, which in cases of amplicon sequencing like we have, so we have multiple units of virtually very similar sequences next to each other, can cause cross-cluster hybridization. So this is one peculiarity that we need to truly consider. So um, we started testing how amplicon sequencing works on uh, my sick and we we used for that biological clones to evaluate um, what kind of errors we expect to see. We do see mostly substitutions, some indels, some, some homopolymers, and we see some cross-cluster hybridization. What is shown on this picture is actually the sequence we ob obtain in, in raw uh, form from a single clone. So the expected sequence is highlighted here. Everything we see here uh, in that uh, network is additional uh, sequences that derive from errors. So understanding this is helping us build better algorithms how to deal with the data. So we tested, these are the lab, uh, wet lab parameters that we've tested to optimize how we acquire reliable clusters. 
I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want to make you aware that we did check all these parameters and found the optimal ones. And those are the informatics parameters. In, this is in no great detail uh, what we have gone through, but for sake of brevity, I just want to make sure um, everybody understands that we, we went through to a great length to ensure accuracy. We also added a second layer of indexing to the, uh, so what you see on top here is Amplicon with barcoding as is uh, commercially available, which for the purposes of accurate Amplicon analysis is not adequate. So we, we added an additional layer in a, a special combinatorial tagging of the Amplicons to allow for better demultiplexing of the data. And in conclusions, the reconstruction of true quasi-species of HCV is truly crucial for outbreak investigation, intra-host evolution studies, and certainly surveillance. Data from our experiments with biological clones show that there's a need for custom algorithm for uh, merging and error correction of the uh, viral amplicon sequences that come off the Next.js platform. And so for accurate interpretation, we uh, created filters. We created appropriate uh, filters of the reads and appropriate pipeline procedures to, to deal with the data. And um, this wet lab and um, data management implementation is now living in Ghost. And, uh, hosted on the on a CDC WebEx application. And Yuri would talk to you about this in a moment. Um, any questions? Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, we have time for one or two questions. Uh, yeah, Chris Petropoulos from LabCorp. So, um, can I ask if you're using the HVR1 sequence to, to show those beautiful pictures you showed, would you see the same thing if you used NS5B, which is much more highly conserved? So I guess my, you know, and the second part of that question is, is um, your ability to, to find linkages between patients um, that wouldn't necessarily show up with the consensus. Is that because you're using a highly variable region or I mean, is, would, you, would you see them if you actually use the, the NS5B domain? That, actually, what you would see in NS5B, you would see much more identical cases. So there, where wouldn't there be true transmission? Another appropriate region to use, and we've done this in longitudinal studies, when the transmission has happened way in the past was in NS5A. NS5B is very appropriate for genotyping, but is not adequate. NS5B is a good clue to see which one, if, especially if it's a very large scale investigation, which ones we want to look at. But typically, um, HVR1 gives much better detail on the relationships. NS5B is too similar. So okay, so if you use like NS5A, which is more variable. Um, HVR1 I, is more variable. Right, but, but I mean yeah. another more variable region. Right. Would you actually see the same pattern, or would it be different? Would you yes. Ex yeah? Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. But you would be able to see it. There's a little bit less change in time. So if the transmission occurred further back in time, NS5B would be the better bet to look at, because HVR1 now would have diverged too much. So you're assuming that this HVR1 space is also occupied by the NS5A space. The, the, the different parts of the viruses are not going in different directions or something? No, it's just a different so, pace. Yeah. HVR1 changes more, freak, more uh, faster, <laughs> turns, turns over faster. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Lilia. Sure. So uh, um, uh, let me turn um, this over now to uh, Yuri Kudyukov, uh, who will actually talk about um, this uh, system, the, the GHOST system. And, she may be able to answer in some more depth some of the, the questions which, which just came up about the technology. Oh, thank you for the introduction. Um, you heard already several times mention of Ghost. Uh, yesterday and today, Lila showed uh, our website. 
uh, in your wonderful introduction, I'm almost probably going to go straight to the business. <laughs> what is ghost? <laughs> ghost, we build it for molecular surveillance. And molecular surveillance must be massive if we want it to be effective. But in order to be massive, it should be, uh, it should be streamlined, it should be simple, it should be definitely affordable, and it must be in real time. Otherwise, information may come to us too late to, to, to do any interventions. However, there are two major challenges. Uh, first of all, is cost of, of the whole thing and complexity, especially by informatic analysis that we need to do in order to identify, let's say, um, transmissions. That's why GHOST uh, was built to alleviate those two um, significant uh, problems, and it built of three uh, major parts. It is next generation sequencing to take, to take, to take molecular data. And uh, in this case, molecular data are treated as a specimen, uh, which is used by cyber assay or computational program uh, to identify public health information, which we're looking for. Let's say detection of transmissions. So this is a program that acts as a diagnostic assay. And then we need to disseminate these assays to our users, which we do uh, through the internet and free of charge. <laughs> so, next generation sequencing, Lila showed this slide. Uh, we're using Amplicon sequencing. In this case, we're using HVR1, how we're planning to use an S5A and core region. And uh, why are we using this? Because we get significantly more information when we go in depth with sample structure of the population using single amplicon, and we get more genetic information than we would get from whole genome. And in this case, we have strong genetic identity from this uh, quasi-species structure, and then we may uh, sequence, since it's only one amplicon we take from single, uh, each and every specimen, we may multiplex, we may sequence, let's say, hundreds of amplicons from hundreds of patients in a single uh, mysic run. And obviously, this leads to reduction in cost per specimen. Now, we get sequences. It's single, uh, single amplicon sequences. We go in depth. Usually, how outbreak investigation is being done. You have serum specimens. Then you sequence. Let's say you use next gen. You get many, many sequences from six patients or for many patients. Then you need to build phylogenetic tree. You need to be an expert in building those phylogenetic trees, right? And then you analyze this tree in order to understand if you have transmission linkages. And the way it's usually done, you analyze clustering by this. And in this cluster, let's say you have quasi-species or intra-host variants sampled from eight different patients. You say eight different patients share the same cluster, they share the same strain. So it is a transmission. It is a long way. You wanted to, to know about transmissions, but you end up with model which requires interpretation. And frequently, it is very, very complex interpretations. We start in ghost. We start from sequences again, but then we replace this model with new models. And this model takes the sequences, as I said, it treats those sequences as a specimen, and crunches those sequences, and then automatically produces information which we ask, which we train this model to give us. In this case, it is transmission network that's being built. It is transmission linkages it, be, uh, it detects. Instead of looking at this phylogenetic tree, now we see this network, and in this case, we have each and every node. It is a patient, and they're linked if they, have, uh, if they share the same strain. But what are those models? Uh, I'm just giving you a short glimpse, like quick uh, look at what models potentially can be used. We built three models right now. It can be model of threshold model. When we have quasi-species sampled, let's say, from two patients. We have two clouds. Now we may measure genetic distances between these two clouds and say, this model says, if this distance below the threshold, then it is the same strain. If above the threshold, the, those cases not related. And we were able to build these models because we have significant collection of outbreaks already investigated and supported epidemiologically. So we could validate this model. So we validated all these three models. In this model, actually, it is based on clustering using expectation maximization algorithm. And in this case, it says, if you have cluster that uh, shares variants from two patients, you have transmission. In this case, we have probabilistic model uh, based on Markov process. And um, 
the beauty of this model is that it also suggests direction of transmission, what is different from these uh, uh, two models. And this is actual output. It's automatic outputs. Uh, we feed it with sequences, and you get transmission linkages. This is actually a real outbreak that we investigated this. To reiterate the point, instead of looking at a uh, phylogenetic tree where each and every dot here on this tree identifies individual sequences, GOES generates transmission networks where each and every node is a patient in linkage between them if they share strains. So in this case, you have two clusters on phylogenetic tree or you have two transmission clusters identified. But as any diagnostic system, it needs significant quality control. And <coughs> we built um, the system to have internal significant quality control. That models which I showed, they only shown here. It is only this component. It is the model. The rest of this, this is quality control uh, pipeline. What it does, it assigns reads to right patient. It detects uh, errors and uh, corrects those errors. Finally, it go, uh, genotypes the, sequ uh, genotypes the uh, sequences, build clusters, and then it pushes this into analytical pipeline. Here is analytical pipeline. It also built on several blocks. And the whole idea here is not to analyze those cases that for sure are not going to be linked. So you need to sort them out. That's what it does. And finally, you get to this point when you have sequences from patients that potentially may be linked. Then this block analyzes them, builds these links. But then we have another quality control. We validate each and every link. And if they validate it, we build this network. And I'll show you just like examples of this. I suppose to show these examples. <laughs> All right, it doesn't work. Um, uh, uh, we are supposed to show you live um, uh, how those networks look. Uh, we had it working before, uh, before this session, uh, something happened. But anyway, this is the uh, networks we're going to see. In this case, it is an Indiana outbreak. And you have cases shown here uh, in different colors. In the center, the linked cases, it is from Indiana. Here, here we have 23 different cases. And in blue, unlinked cases are those that are not unrelated cases. So that's what it does. You submit it to the model, and you get this uh, output. But we need to organize it into a system, into a website. So that's what it was done. Here is uh, current uh, ghost architecture. You start with the um, user uh, computer uh, workstation. Then we need to authenticate each and every person. We're not allowed to anyone to use it. We need to authenticate these peop people. Then we go inside of our firewall. But this all analytics, all this part is in the cloud. So what actually uh, GOES does? It's very simple. Um, data generated locally by individual laboratory or by, as we call it, GOES center. So those laboratories that have significant volume of specimens, either they themselves have the significant uh, volume of sample, or they can collect it from surrounded, uh, surrounding geographic uh, regions. So sequencing done here. Then it is submitted to the website. Website analyzes this automatically and presents this information back to the users. So what it does, it enables our users, and we target in public health laboratories, independently, cost-effectively, and accurately uh, to do outbreak investigations. And we're now piloting this. I'm just giving this, uh, passing this to Tennessee. We're piloting this now with uh, Ghost West Eastern Tennessee, and we're going to have uh, four more laboratories mm -hmm. piloting this very soon. It is better, better testing so far. We're still building this system. And uh, Ghost can be used, uh, since it is a website-based uh, diagnostic technology, it can be used in any mobile device. It, um, so basically, it can be done from your iPhone, so you go can ghost your outbreak. Uh, from the uh, from the <laughs> iPhone, and in this case, this mobile device is actually your uh, diagnostic instruments. It's not only right now I describe only detection of transmissions, but we already have uh, models or cyber assays in making for detection of resistance and virulence. And here is my last slide. What Ghost is? It is next generation of 
diagnostics, cyber molecular diagnostic, which is organized into a system and applied in this case to surveillance. It organizes entire process from collecting the data through ghost centers to automatically generating public health relevant information. And it's based on the concept of cyber assays or computer programs that extract public health information automatically from genetic data. And through this, it builds basically virtual laboratories. They're doing the same thing. And here is the contribution, basically people from CDC, from Edson, from informatics office, from division of oral hepatitis, and I hope soon to see many people from public health laboratories or from companies who will uh, work with us on development of this system. Thank you. Thanks. You know, in the interest of time, maybe we'll hold questions until after the, the next talk and we okay. have the, the, the panel session. Um, uh, the next talk is actually um, uh, uh, the experience of applying the system, the GOES system in, in Tennessee. We have uh, Linda Thomas from the Tennessee State Department of Health. Hello. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for staying at quarter after two on a Friday. I know everybody is ready to go home and start the weekend, but I would like to thank each and every one of you for staying and listening to me. And I am Linda, Tennis uh, Linda Thomas from Tennessee Department of Health State Lab. So I am here to talk to you a little bit about the State Public Health Lab, the HCV ghost diagnostic um, process that we've gone through from June 1st of this year, to, and it's still going until October 1st and what it has meant for the state public health in Tennessee, and hopefully we will use this experience to roll out to other public health labs. Why Tennessee? Well, I'm a molecular and enteric manager, but I'm really, uh, we've kind of renamed it as an outbreak and response center, so I am part of nine different programs here at the CDC. And what that means is I am a federally funded state employee, thank you CDC for paying for my salary. And that means that we have been a pilot in many different programs, from CryptoNet to FoodNet, Norastat, KhaleesiNet on down. And so Tennessee, which leads us into this, why Tennessee? Well, CDC has conducted an HIV risk vulnerability assessment last fall. And when they looked at counties that had the potential of being the next Scott County, Indiana, we realized that 41 of these counties were in my state. So with that said, Tennessee has this vulnerability and we knew this. And so the state, my state epidemiologist and my laboratory director had come and said, uh oh, we have this vulnerability of having seeing HCV in our state. We need to implement this into the state public health lab. So long before the HCV ghost ever came along, my lab was in the process of developing HCV tests. That includes the EIA and the NAT. And that is what we're doing right now. We do a screening and then we do a confirmation of the NAT. And then we go one step forward and we're doing molecular sequencing. And we have done molecular sequencing for about two or three years under the PulseNet um, AMD project, which Dr. Armstrong is part of. Um, we are a PulseNet area lab. We service six states, including Puerto Rico. And so we have that infrastructure already in place, which made us uh, uh, able to implement this project. And it wouldn't be a talk if I didn't add at least a, a finding. So uh, the, all I want to do is touch on the base that this is a uh, study of 189 pregnant women testing positive for HCV in eastern Tennessee. And I would just want to point out that 94 of these have, were sharing straws. So there are other means and methods, modes of transmission besides the HIV that, we, that might be vulnerable for of having HCV come up positive. So we've talked about why Tennessee. Where, what about where, who, and what? Currently right now, we are only testing three counties. That's Knox County, which is Knoxville, Tennessee, Chattanooga, which is Hamilton County, and Johnson City, which is Sullivan County. And we have collected the data for the last, uh, since June 1st, and 
We are collecting it on reproductive age men and women in sexually transmitted disease and family planning clinics. And we are testing anybody that's coming in on a routine basis. They come in, they get a lab done, they find out if they're EIA positive. If they are, then they will get that NAT. And then we will go one step further and do the little sequencing and upload it to GHOST. So we can talk all day long about imputation, and this is where the, the, the heart and soul of the reason why I'm here. Has anybody ever tried to order an instrument through the government process? <laughs> it, it's not easy, right? It's not the UPS, FedEx, or the FDS, the front door service where it's dropped down in the front of your door in two days or less, like Amazon Prime, right? It's not easy. So when we implement a process into, the state of, uh, into a public health lab, there's a lot of things that we, are, that we need to go through. And I think that Dr. Parker uh, had, uh, had really great, touched on this earlier about validating a test. But it's not just that. It's about cost. Well, who is going to do the test? Uh, do we dedicate a person for just HCV testing? What about the workflow? Do we have lab space? Usually a lot of times the lab is stuck in the side of a hospital. There's not always, those are challenges that we have to overcome. But these are challenges that can be overcome and the state of Tennessee did that. Well, I just want to say that uh, whatever the challenge is, we are a pilot state, we've gone through it. I can relate to what you guys, any other public health that wants to implement this process, we can put that into place and we can find out how we can make it better. Now these are the totals. Since June 1st, we have done 2,615 patients that have come through the lab, just since June 1st, and that's only in three counties. We have 93 counties in the state of Tennessee. So with that, of the EIAs, there was about a 7% or 8% positivity rate. We had done uh, the reactive, uh, confirmation, which has about uh, 71. And then, this I do want to show you what a MySeq instrument looks like, because I noticed in all of these other slides, we talk about next generation sequencing, but I don't know if any of you have ever seen an instrument. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> but this is what the results of GHOST it didn't work? looks like. And I think Dr. Yuri wanted to show that. <laughs> <laughs> I stole it. Yeah. What this means is Tennessee had performed the test. And we had taken, and Dr. Lilia and Dr. Suma had come to the state of Tennessee to, to train. And they got to actually cook in a state public health lab instead of cooking in their, in their kitchen at the CDC. And this helped because they understood how the state public health works. And, and then from here, they can be able to roll that out into other state public health labs. And maybe the training will be done here. Maybe they'll be doing it other other laboratories. But either way, they came and we pulled five random samples that were positive out of the, that, that slide that I showed two, two slides earlier. And we have performed the sequencing on uh, next generation sequencing, the Amplicon testing. And then they, we shipped these same samples off to the CDC so they can run these samples. And here are the, two, here are the five samples. And they, we, the reproducibility, the accuracy, the intra, the intra, inter assay is all there. That means that each one of these are the same if you label them. And if I pull this out, you will see Maybe I'm pinned the node, like I was. But as you can see, Tennessee 10 S10 is the CDC sample, which is the same exact sample as the TN10 is the CDC sample that they perform here, and the 224-225 is the sample we performed at the state. And so we were able to match up the same results. And what we want to do from this time forward for HCV in the GHOST surveillance program is to make sure that all public health labs from this time forward are standardized 
They run it the same way. They are able to reproduce the same way, and that there will be no cross-reactivity and so forth and so on. And so we hope that with this experience going forth that we can pull out and get more public health states get become part of this GOES program so that we can set out forth treatment and prevention to, to help the vulnerability of HCV in decreasing this in the population. I would like to say thank you to each and every one of you for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, a lot of times um, it's uh, epi-based, or um, uh, and I understand that, but uh, one message I would like to say is that public health is here to serve the population, and without that, without having the laboratory and the epidemiologists and the environmental health all coming together and communicating and collaborating with one another, we can't prevent anything or stop or treat things that are going on. And HCV, obviously, in the last two days I've heard, is touching a lot of people, especially half that don't even know that they have it. And then this is a picture of all of us in the state lab here, at, or at the state public health in Tennessee, when they came and tried us. Thanks, and uh, maybe we just go directly into the um, into the panel discussion. So, uh, um, uh, and I can uh, start out with the questioning. Um, let me just ask, uh, actually, the the uh, various speakers up here. You, you know, the we're moving into a new phase here, using uh, molecular diagnostics um, in a surveillance setting to uh, presumably to identify outbreaks. Um, this, this is something we haven't done before. This, this tool has proven very useful in investigating outbreaks, particularly hospital-borne outbreaks, but we don't have uh, experience yet in applying this on a large scale uh, for, for surveillance. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how you thought this would be applied and what sort of, um, what sort of interventions were likely to come about as, as, you know, once, once, you start, uh, once you start getting this data through the GOES system. Um, very complex question. <laughs> we just started. Um, we applied molecular tools for outbreak investigation predominantly. In this case, you understand that epidemiological links were already given or suspected because cluster of the cases is detected. Then we go with molecular detection, either confirm or not confirming uh, this outbreak. But this is different settings. In surveillance setting, when we may get specimens um, collected, we may not have this epidemiological support, and we need uh, to rely predominantly on analysis of these sequences. So interpretation of those links, maybe uh, which we may identify, let's say using ghost or telegenetic analysis, if anybody will try. Um, those links need to be interpreted differently. In outbreak settings, things, that's why cluster was identified, things happened recently. So those links but must probably identify direct linkages between those patients. In what out, uh, one of those networks I showed in the center of the slide, it is injection drug users. Those people infected uh, this big cluster, 130 cases, and 50 of them infected with more than one genotype, so more than one strain. So in this case, linkages need to be interpreted di differently. It is not direct transmission, maybe. It may be chains of transmission, and we detect only some members of those chains of transmissions for different viruses. And when we have this network identified in surveillance settings, it does not mean that it is single strain that circulates among those people. So uh, all this needs to be taken in into consideration. However, Detection of those transmissions is very important for uh, developing implementations, for developing strategies to interrupt those, um, uh, those transmission networks. Because in this case, we know that those people have share risk factor. That's why they infected with the same strain. We even know who infected with what strain, who link is stronger than uh, uh, with anybody else. And this information can be used to target those people, to treat them, to link them to, um, uh, let's say, syringe exchange program program to other harm reduction uh, uh, programs in order to more cost effective in more in more effective way to destroy this network of transmission 
Hi. So I have a, this, it's Monica Parker, Wadsworth Center. I have a logistics question. So, so the laboratory does the sequencing, the MySeq, and you upload the data files to Ghost, and the magic happens. And then you're showing the file, but ha what is either how it's set up to happen or in envisioned, how does Epi get that information? Would they log in? Or do you, does the lab transmit? How does that connection made? Yeah, another important question. Uh, <laughs> as I said, we just at the very beginning, we're developing the whole system. Please note that um, what we developed is extraction of epidemiological information from molecular data. So in this case, when GOES shows this to people linked by transmission, they share the same strain. This is epidemiological information by itself. So that, and this acts as a diagnostic system that detects the sequences and detects this parameter which we wanted to know. For example, I know that here is the cluster of cases epidemiologically. I want to know if they share the same strain, if there is a common source so I can go intervene and destroy uh, this network, uh, prevent uh, further transmissions. So this ghost provides this epidemiological information. But uh, as a next step, it definitely should be linked to additional epidemiological information on metadata. In this case, uh, the whole thing becomes significantly more powerful. And we need to develop the system with um, and foundation for the system we built right now. Right, because I, I, I mean, the beauty of this, like if you're doing an outbreak and you have a phylogenetic tree, that always ex requires some explanation. It's, it's harder to um, transmit the who's transmitting to who through that me mechanism. But with this system, it, it's immediately obvious who's connected, right? So it seems like that is ready to go, that the epi people could take that and, and but I just don't know how that's logistically gonna work. So I guess that's something to come. My other question is for Linda. And so you're now doing all this HCV testing. Was the HCV testing happening in, in any other like commercial or clinical labs before? for that, or is this new? Oh, it, in the state of Tennessee, yes. I'm, I'm sure it pretty much was in it. It's not necessarily was implemented in the state public health right. lab. So in, we saw this vulnerability. We knew yes. that it was occurring in our state, and we, long before June 1st, our laboratory director, my laboratory director, believe it or not, was a virologist. He's big into this, and so he Mine he too. wanted to um, start this. And so um, what was really great was because we had already started the process a year prior to June 1st of starting this GOES project, we had already began the validation of the EIA and the NAT. Mm -hmm. And um, the sequencing department, I have three techs and one supervisor underneath me, so the sequencing um, came very easy for us. Um, we had done, did not do um, necessarily amplicon sequencing, mm -hmm. but we did whole genome sequencing on, mm -hmm. on FBIs, and, and it's not, it's foodborne illness for me, okay. guys. It's not. Bureau, Federal Bureau of Investigation, or you know the guy with the red hat, um, but we we are very familiar with that, and so that is the reason why it was easy for us to roll this out and become a pilot state for this. And for the answer prior to it, we're still working on the EPIs, but for my state. Unlike a lot of other states that have noticed and have traveled around, my state, we have a great rapport with our epidemiologists like Dr. Wester here. Um, we talk on a daily basis, if mm. not weekly. I attend um, meetings once a week at their surveillance meetings for all of this. And so we are on, and we're not on, in the same building, mm -hmm. but because we work together as one unit, I think that's what makes it stronger. And for those states that are willing to roll something out, I think that is vital. That is, okay. that is going to be part of handling an outbreak and being able to handle any outbreak um, is, is to have that rapport with your epidemiologist and your environmental specialist. And with the ghost, we're still working on getting the epi information linked to get together, but we have all of that. Right. And they put that into a national database. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, and uh, if I could just take the prerogative to add to what, what uh, both of them said, it's, um, 
you know, with the uh, amount of genomic data that's being generated now for public health purposes, this, this data is orders of magnitude more complex than most of the data we deal with. And we are really struggling with how, do you, how you communicate this with epidemiologists and, and, and with the public. And it's clear that you know, we, we need some better tools for visualizing this, and, and, they're, and they're just not where they need to be right now. Um, quite frankly, the single most elegant tool we have right now is, is at CDC is, is the GHOST system. It's a, it's a shame that Yuri wasn't able to, to demonstrate that. It's, it's actually very intuitive. Um, uh, and I think exactly the, the, the direction that, that we need to be going in this regard. But um, uh, you know what Linda was saying is, 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 is right you now. We're, we're still going to have to be working very closely with uh, epidemiologic staff, and it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a tall uh, learning curve. Oh, if I can add uh, a little, oh, sorry, did I cut it? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the way we uh, envision to use, uh, uh, how the system can be used, it is uh, total collaboration between laboratory and um, uh, oh, sorry, you know, uh, between laboratory uh, and epidemiologists. Let's say epidemiologists in the field uh, identified the cluster. Information came. Specimens came to the laboratory. Let's say to Linda's laboratory. She tested this, and information immediately epidemiologists being informed that data available. And in this case, epidemiologist has access to this website, opens this, and analyzes the sequences itself, by itself, um, um, uh, without any help from the laboratory. Or if somebody already analyzed this and you share your account, you just simply may go ahead and check on this information because it's already available to you. So that's how the whole thing would work. So that's how it may work with, let's say, ghost centers that may serve, let's say, uh, more than one county, for example, or m more than one state. Epidemiologists submitted specimens, get informed that information available, and analyzes this data using ghost. And it is very easy to use. There is not much to learn uh, how to deal with this. And information would be just like what is shown on the screen. Here is like a big cluster. In each and every node here is a patient, so you just simply click on this saying show labels and you will see who is linked. And there are two, uh, two small clusters, you, you will see those patients too who are linked by transmission. Now you know that you have at the very least three different sources for this infection. Now as epidemiologist, you need to understand how that happened in order for you to uh, intervene and prevent this from uh, further dissemination of this uh, hepatitis C viral strains. Okay. I was just curious. So we're not talking about transmission direction, right? I mean, there's no ability to to um, determine who infected who, right? No, we do. Uh, we do. I showed one of those models. I simply m m most probably mumbled this, uh, but uh, uh, there is one of the models that uh, det suggest uh, direction of transmission. Okay, because I, I think that brings up a whole another set of ethical and legal issues that probably need to be dealt with in some form. There's still criminality associated with transmission of certain infectious diseases. So, um, but that's good to appreciate. Um, my, my other question is, um, so is there a certain amount of coverage that, that is optimal and how do, you, um, how do you exclude or filter out sequences that might be um, in a sample or in a read um, be, because of some low level of cross-contamination. So if you're looking at the individual reads, you might see, you might see some background that, um, that's not, that might influence your analysis, but, but you really need to filter those out and exclude them. Oh yeah, we do, uh, we do all this. Um, I just didn't describe all those tools which we have in our quality control pipeline. Uh, but we um, definitely look uh, into this and we look at these cross-contaminations as well. The last tool which I showed, uh, link validation, that's what it does. Okay. Uh, it's basically trying to say, um, it's just basically saying it is high probability that this link is not real. It is most probably cross-contamination. And it's just simply being removed automatically. So the end users not going to even know what happened. Okay. okay. Is there a certain amount of coverage? I mean, if we have a data set and we want to, say, explore this, this analysis tool, is, is there a certain amount of coverage that's optimal? 
um, uh, I know that if you have, let's say, uh, two, three, five thousand reads, it must probably be sufficient. But since we're dealing with MySeq that generates 20 million yeah, reads, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you run even your hundred specimens, you're already way over. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I actually wanted to ask a question and maybe make a point. Uh, I, I guess the question is, you're looking at sort of recent uh, transmission patterns. Uh, what happens uh, when transmissions may have occurred over uh, many years and you come in to look at, that, uh, uh, at the transmission that's going on? I know for HIV, by uh, seven years, the, uh, the um, sequence changes are sufficient enough so that you lose the linkage between person A and person B. Uh, so the question is, uh, do you know any of that information for uh, hepatitis C? Yeah. Um, we have experience of uh, investigating an outbreak which happened, transmission happened 12 years before we even get the specimen. And we were able to detect this, so linkage still was there. But in, uh, with uh, time, we obviously become uh, less sensitive. Uh, because yes, it is true, we, don't, uh, we, don't, we cannot understand how virus would evolve and how far apart uh, it will go from what uh, it was at the very beginning. So we may miss those transmissions that happened way in, in the past. Uh, the other point I was going to make was um, you're, you're just doing uh, amplification of a selected region, the HRV, HVR1 region. And, uh, but if you do whole genome sequencing and then eventually subtract out the human sequences and the low complexity sequences, you really have everything that's in a sample and you never have to go back to that sample. So your interest may be currently in hepatitis C. But if those sequences are archived in your database, if a new virus arises, <coughs> you can go back and actually look for those sequences uh, at, at that time with ever, without ever having to archive the sample anymore. Oh, yeah, that's actually the advantages of GHOST. Um, we archive the sequences. And the sequences uh, have uh, signif significant information, sufficient information for us um, to identify uh, strains of hepatitis C virus. That's why we call our um, program cyber assays, because they act as diagnostic assays. And when we develop, let's say, a new program for detection of transmissions, or we're right now developing programs that detect um, a predisposition to drug resistance to certain drugs, or predisposition to uh, significant to HCC, let's say, or can detect stages of infection, we always may go back to those sequences, not to specimens, and test those those sequences. That's the beauty of this next generation diagnostics. When you have computer programs acting as diagnostic assays, as diagnostic kits. I would like to, to make a point here about you. You were trying to make an argument that actually a whole genome approach, not an amplicon approach, would be more prudent if we want to store data and go look at it. At the well, it may time not be more purposes. useful. I mean, for what you're looking at, you can look at the variable region here, uh, and you can see the uh, the variation and be able to link, you know, person A to person B, or look at a transmission pattern. But uh, what you're losing in just doing that, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. We used to do something similar to that for HIV, but we didn't have deep sequencing, next-gen sequencing. We used to have to do cloning uh, to do that, which is very cumbersome. Uh, so we could see all the variants within an individual. Uh, by doing whole genome sequences, you have all the sequences in that sample. If you want to go back and look for a different virus, you know, that, that it now is, a, a, like, all of a sudden, that the is, Zika ever there. Right? That, that is completely correct. There is a big drawback, though. The, the cost of doing metagenome sequencing uh, per person uh, with the enrichment to remove the human uh, DNA is quite high, so it's not practical, number one. Number two, if we are not to choose that route, if we just amplify um, metagenome without any enrichment, then the presence of any um, other DNA other than human is below 1% typically. So it really becomes 
worse than a needle in a haystack if you want to go back and look at something else. So it's, it's, it, it's cost it's only issue. It's sequence is present in a very low copy number. Right. Yeah. Oh, let me add, I must probably, um, I thought I answered, but I didn't, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, when you talk about whole genome, you're saying that you may detect, let's say, drug resistance later on should you want to, since you have entire genome. In reality, uh, you can do it from single amplicon. We've already proven this and published on this. Because entire genome should be considered as the entire system. So there's significant coevolution among different sites. They don't vary at well in any possible way. It is, they're linked with the rest of the genome. It's called epistatic connectivity. So uh, that's why when we, may, we may identify regions that contribute the most into this epistatic connect connectivity and evolution. And we actually identified already those regions. That's why right now we're dealing with HVR1 alone, but we're already extending this to uh, two more uh, regions. And that will fill, at least from all our modeling, what we have, that we feel would be absolutely sufficient information to build any model, drug resistance, any drug. It does not matter is it polymerase and S5B and S5A or anything else. We still will be able to detect uh, predisposition to this resistance or sensitivity to certain drugs. And we still will have enough information for, let's say, stage uh, fibrosis. We published on this as well uh, using genetic sequences. So whole genome, or, but we need to look into a uh, population. We need to have structure of the population sampled as much as we can because structure of the population, because it reflects all selection pressure supplied on the virus, intrahost, it reflects it more sensitively than consensus sequence built uh, for the whole genome. Yes. <coughs> Thanks. <coughs> Well, first, let me thank and congratulate Yuri and his team for a job well done in developing this uh, system. And, and I thank the state collaborators now. They're helping us um, uh, bring it into full production online. And I want to thank Greg for supporting the development of it through AMD. So it really comes to the uh, you know, issues around scalability and how do you scale this up. And you know, I had a conversation with Linda you know, yesterday even about just the you know, sort of the cloud capacity to you know, begin to exchange data through the system. So I thought maybe Yuri or Linda, you could talk about the, you know, the, uh, what's needed to, to bring this out. And I say this in part because just, just, you know, just over the last few minutes, I got yet another state requesting, you know, access, you know, to go. So that, you know, the word is spreading here. So, and then also we've talked a lot about cost of test. So I thought maybe you could also, um, you know, touch on the cost of testing and, and how you get those test uh, costs as low as possible, please. Um, that was what we need to discuss. Um, uh, starting with the first part uh, in terms of scalability of GHOST. Uh, yeah, that's why we started working with um, uh, cloud, and we use an Amazon cloud, an idea was that we would have uh, uh, significant computational capacity in the cloud. But we need to consider also um, cybersecurity issues, because when we have our system in the Amazon cloud, we're going through our um, firewall twice when we put information there and when we collect it back here inside on our servers before we give it to our users. So in this case, there are significant uh, cybersecurity issues. That's why we were significantly restricted at the very beginning in the computational, uh, in cap computational capacity that was available to us. And we built our system to accommodate to those resources that became available. Um, but now um, ITSO changing the, its, its policy and they allow us to use significantly greater resources that are available in Amazon Cloud. But now we need to reconfigure our website, our tools in order to accommodate these new uh, available to us resources. And this is actually a natural process. We start from something, then we grow, and we eventually get into something else, then we may drop something, new, uh, new resources available or new opportunities available, we start moving. So the whole system need to, need to evolve. And in this case, 
it definitely, um, you would not expect definitely uh, in a diagnostic summit to talk about website, uh, IT uh, structure, <laughs> computational models, but that's what is coming. That's actually what penetrates ev everything. And right now, that's what we need to develop, understand and how to build these resources, how to use them the most efficient way, how to build system that would be suitable for public health and for clinicians as well, because if we build this predisposition to drug resistance, uh, let's say tools clinicians may use, or they may stage fibrosis, let's say using our tools, then FDA, uh, may become interested in what it is that we're doing with our diagnostic assays. So there are policy issues on each and every corner, uh, and we just started, and I hope that together we're going to build it. But there is significant demand right now for IT resources, for understanding how we're going to build. We need to put more people into developing this. And in terms of cost, uh, obviously, um, uh, since MySeq, or uh, let's say Illumina technology which we're using, which now predominantly used in public health laboratories, allow to sequence, get significant number of sequences like 20 million, 100 million sequences from single run, we may multiplex, we may sequence more specimens at once. Uh, and then cost per specimen will significantly drop. And then if you have an outbreak of five specimens, you send it to Ghost Center, you're gonna uh, it's going to cost you maybe $100 only to, to do this. Then you may do again, um, eventually. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but the whole system, the whole capacity needs to be built. And it is definitely should be built with something what provides you with information which you need in the most... Uh, uh, understandable way, directly, without actually um, um, analyzing molecular data. This would be analyzed directly for you, automatically, by using these cyber tools. And we need to put more resources, I believe, more people in development of this system. And I ask uh, every public health laboratory that considers eventually to do hepatitis C test and um, to start communicating with us and help us to develop this system. Because this development needs to be done in real situation when we understand what it is that we're building. And eventually it will become a really powerful system. And from the state public health lab, let me just explain on my side. As Dr. Yuri explained on his side where his, where his challenges and implementations are. In the state public health lab, um, we, in, in, in being a PulseNet area lab, and now we are one of seven states that was awarded an ARLN lab, an antimicrobial resistance lab, we are more than ever wanting to hook up our sequencers to the internet. And speaking on, to an, um, folks that are computer science backgrounds, not with anything bad against them, it's just to trying to explain to them that um, patient information is not on that information that's going across the internet, and trying to explain to the IT folks that it's all de-identified, and getting that through to the policymakers and allowing the laboratory to connect to the internet has been a very great challenge in the public health. Now, I've noticed that other states, and as I traveled from state to state, and done many different talks from different uh, uh, programs, some states don't have that problem. They just hooked up their MySeqs and went to the internet and straight to the cloud and they didn't, uh, it wasn't that there was a security issue. We have issues at the state of Tennessee that take very seriously with, with security, firewalls, upgrades, vi uh, viruses, and so forth. And so it wasn't, it's not that easy. Also, I have um, played around with Ghost. Um, I have three members of my team that have, that have access to the SAMs in the Ghost program. But we haven't quite uploaded to the capacity in which we don't know if it's going to tie down um, our RAM speeds or tie up the other internet to the other computers in the lab. Unfortunately, my lab does not have a server there. It is located off-site. So it would have been great if we had a million dollar server and that we can not worry about the speed, but the speed is quite slow at our at our state. And so that is one of those things that I'm going to communicate back to them when I go back to the state public health. And so going forward, other public health or, or laboratories are going to have that same issues, those same challenges, those same implementations. Great. Well, listen, thank you. I, I would like to thank our
panel is a quick question. Uh, just a comment. So okay, I, go ahead. I, I, I appreciate those comments. I think what keeps me up at night is not the de-identification and the security on, on, the, on the donor side of things. I think eventually the data gets out there and someone who has a different perspective sees a presentation or a publication and realizes that there is an identification of certain individuals in a publication that are totally de-identified and then a position of authority demands to know who those people are. And I think that's a real concern and I think we have to, to figure out how to, how to confront that because again, there still is criminality associated with disease transmission and you could open a journal and see two completely de-identified you know, individuals in a case study, and, and someone, you know, could, could then go through a legal process to gain access to their identification. So that, that's what keeps me up at night. Not, and I wish it weren't that way, because then we could share the And that's the reason why Tennessee Sorry. has been very skeptical of, of, of doing anything through um, hooking up any of the instruments yeah, in that. Yeah. We just agree. All right, listen, I'd like to thank the panel. Uh, uh, for an excellent session today. I'm Carolyn Wester, again from Tennessee, and what we were asked to do was kind of from the local health department perspectives, uh, give you some ideas of programmatic and policy issues impacting our health departments with respect to um, addressing HCV in our jurisdictions. So just very briefly, um, what HCV, this is just acute HCV, uh, chronic HCV has not been reportable, at least uh, not until this year via labs, but gives you an idea, this is, um, these are a scatter plot of acute cases which represent just the tip of the iceberg of actual acute cases. We know most are asymptomatic. Per CDC surveillance reports, that represents probably only about a 13th of the actual um, cases, but you can see a predominance in the Eastern Corridor, which is our drug corridor. And you can see that compared to the U.S., uh, Tennessee ranks, uh, our case rates are much higher, and we have consistently, even with a paucity of surveillance, uh, ranked in the top five states. But I know that is um, probably kind of fair playing ground for everybody. We also know that we have an intersection of epidemics um, and that opioid use is, uh, abuse is actually fueling the HCV epidemic and putting us on a precipice of vulnerability of having intersecting HIV and HCV epidemics. And you've seen the top left graph, but from uh, MMWR last year, uh, in the light blue um, and in the dark blue, you can see increasing case rates from 2006 to 2012 of acute hep C in four Appalachian states, including Tennessee. And the rates are going up in both non-urban in the light blue, as well as urban in the dark blue, but certainly faster and two to three-fold higher in the non-urban areas. And in the bottom right, you can see the solid line that's the top, which are basically, oh, and these, I'm sorry, are among young individuals less than 30 years of age. Um, but uh, in parallel to that, over the same time frame in the same four states, basically opioid admissions going up and those attributed to heroin use uh, going up in the bottom dotted line as those uh, associated with prescription opioid admission are going down. And I'm just providing context. In 2012, uh, our CSMD, the Controlled Substance Monitoring Database, which measures um, um, milligrams of morphine equivalents, uh, both per patient receiving them as well as per provider prescribing them, went into place, became really robust in 13. And so you could see um, even in this graph, the beginning of the decrease in prescription opioids being offset by basically street heroin. Uh, we also know, um, thanks to CDC, with their vulnerability assessment that of Tennessee's 95 counties, 41 um, uh, rank in the top 5% nationally uh, for vulnerability of a superimposed HIV outbreak. Uh, the top, these are just acute uh, cases of HCV for 2014. If you do five years, it looks very similarly, but darker color counties have higher case rates. Um, at the bottom, these are newly diagnosed HIV, not necessarily incident, but newly diagnosed in that year. Um, most of our HIV epidemic is in greater metropolitan Memphis and Nashville, but you can see Knox County kind of towards the right in the middle. Um, has definitely an overlap, so one of our most vulnerable areas for a superimposed ep epidemic. When we're thinking of what we can do in health departments um, 
to help strengthen the continuum of cure here, and this is based on Dr. Hol Holmberg's study published in the New England Journal in 2013. We look at prevention coming before and after, obviously preventing infection in the first place, and then for those who have cleared the virus, um, keeping them um, uh, clear of um, reinfection. Surveillance and education certainly spans all the silos, um, testing, whether it's uh, initial antibody or confirmation, and then navigation and case management. And to kind of tease that out a little bit, and again, these are all the kind of things that we want to be part of in terms of prevention, so education for both community and provider, hep B vaccination, syringe exchange, opioid substitution, PrEP, um, surveillance and outbreak investigation, obviously a mainstay and a, the glue that public health can provide to helping us not only identify pockets, um, but respond in a timely manner, and then being a good steward of resources so that we can actually focus our efforts on those populations that aren't otherwise being covered and are hyper vulnerable. Um, safety net service, this is a big thing that the health department does. We provide safety net services in STD and family planning clinics, and also we don't have FQHCs throughout the state, so a lot of our local health department clinics are actually primary care safety net clinics. Um, laboratory capacity, you heard about it, but sensational. Very appreciative that for these safety net populations that are served by public health, not supplanting what goes to commercial labs, of course. Anybody who has access to a commercial lab, that's where they should be going. But for these populations who would otherwise go untested, having antibody with reflex testing, qualitative currently, um, but we can talk, Linda, um, when we uh, get back. Um, and then the ghost you just heard about. And then also public health is in a, a great position to have partnerships with other state agencies and even beyond. Um, and then just some pilots. But I put this in here, very simple. It just shows if you're looking at kind of the road to treatment for somebody, it's, you know, getting diagnosed and then it's having, at least in the U.S., you know, your pretreatment evaluation and then accessing treatment. <laughs> Um, it's interesting that the barriers, which I tried to identify here in red, are different depending on your payer source. So for individuals who have private insurance or even Medicaid or Medicare, um, getting the diagnostics, thanks to USPS task force recommendations, should not be the hard part. And so that's where we in public health um, and through direction through a recent FOA can really be the cheerleaders of making sure that folks are getting those services who should have access to them through their insurance. Uh, the pretreatment evaluation should not be a barrier. Of course, co-pays and deductibles can hijack that a little bit. And the treatment um, can definitely be a problem, not per AASLD guidelines, but because of eligibility criteria that are put in place by insurers. Um, the safety net population, so this is the bottom row, um, and this is the one where I'm talking about without public health laboratory capacity or health department capacity to help these individuals, they're not going to get diagnosed. And often these are the individuals, you know, I, I think of the slide, Dr. Ward has shown slides where we've got our twin epidemics, we've got our baby boomers who are likely going to fall into those top two rows, but then we've got our incident new cases which are likely going to fall into our bottom row. And without that capacity in the health departments, we're not going to be able to not only navigate them to care, but perhaps detect the outbreaks that we've just been talking about. And ironically, in the bottom right box, treatment for these uninsured populations is not always the barrier because through generous patient assistance plans that have low kind of eligibility criteria, if we get the navigators and the word out and that those things, they're there. Um, so I, I kind of highlighted in green here the things that have to do with policy. Uh, syringe exchange, certainly, that's a policy um, issue that is challenging us. Um, augmenting HCV lab reporting, um, uh, we're, you know, making it reportable. Um, there's a little bit of fear in some jurisdictions with high burdens like ours um, to kind of walk the clinicians in the labs to, or even just our surveillance colleagues to allow that to happen. They're afraid we're going to get overwhelmed very quickly, and I think they're right. And then in red, some of the programmatic things, so building the capacity for rapid detection and response to outbreaks, streamlining case investigation. We're not going to be able to investigate all our chronic cases for sure, so identifying which, um, which we should be, and then those safety net services, and then I talked already about the lab capacity. Um, the testing pilot, I'm actually just for brevity going to fly through that. And next steps, uh, just the FOA that we just received from and our 
applied for uh, CDC just focusing on increased testing and diagnosis. And basically, you know, this isn't all going to be done overnight. And the idea is pick our priority areas and then scale out over a couple years. And so you can see on the bottom what are the populations that we're prioritizing. Well, baby boomers, because they're um, High, high prevalence or uh, high burden of the known infections, and then also injection drug users, and then prioritizing facilities. And again, with FQHCs, it's often just a matter of uh, educating the providers and the clients, but within health departments and substance abuse treatment facilities, it's oftentimes building and supporting that capacity. So remaining challenges, we know prevention has modest surveillance, scant testing, um, I'm talking federal, um, very little. Um, Fortunately, we also have a, um, uh, but, I, but saying that, even though we have scant resources for testing at our level, some of the CDC sur or surveillance, some of the um, national surveillance actually data has been tremendous in helping us move our case forward. So whether it's the MMWRs or the vulnerability assessment, it just shows the power of data in terms of making the case to like our state legislatures. legislators. Um, and then obviously public health laboratory capacity. We have a wonderful relationship with our lab and very appreciative. We go and say, hey, we'd love to do this. Is that possible? How much would it cost to do? And this and that. And we have a lab that's very willing to look into that. We've actually started those discussions about um, quantitative um, and also genotyping. And then um, legislative challenges in terms of um, things like syringe exchange, et cetera. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Barring none, I'll turn it over to them. All right, good afternoon. I can't believe you guys are still here. I can't believe I'm still here. It's, uh, and I hate to, you know, dumb down the whole, the whole thing, but, you know, we're, we're not doing the deep laboratory analysis kind of stuff. Now we're talking about what's going on in the real world with the hepatitis C issues and why we're doing all the laboratory diagnostics and the things we're working on. And, and in Kentucky, it's, it's a, a huge problem, as you all know. So this is the rates of acute hepatitis C in the last, uh, since 2006 to 2014. Now we had a nice drop in 2014. I don't know what 2015 is gonna hold. The data's not out yet. But uh, you can see how far we are above the US rates. And this is the same kind of thing. You're going to see the same things that everybody else has shown you. Um, and I apologize, my slides are very different because I didn't have time to work on them. So I was pulling slides from different presentations and I didn't have time to reformat them all. So, so this one shows uh, Kentucky compared to all the other states. And uh, here is the rate, I mean, the number of cases. So, and this only goes up to 2013. Um, in 2014, we had another uh, 200, and, uh, 200, and, oh, I can't, 200, or, 176, I don't know, the total is 963 now, and, and this graph still holds, and there's no other states above 500. Massachusetts came really close there at 498 now for, those, for that year stretch, but we're still way up there. And the rates are a little bit different, um, and we've moved down now to 4.0, so this, this graph in 2014 would be a little bit different, um, but still, Kentucky's doing fairly badly in the hepatitis C area. Um, of course, we've got the... Um, article that you've seen referenced and the graph you've already seen, this is the third time now I think, but this really characterizes what's going on in Kentucky is the non-urban drug use and it's a lot in Appalachia, a lot in northern Kentucky. You know, we, do, we, ha we have drug users in the urban areas too and they have the most um, exchange of needles and things like that, but the urban areas, the rates are much higher for drug use because the population is much lower. So um, this is just looking at the number of uh, hospital visits over the 2009 to 2012 uh, time frame, you can see we're in the tens of thousands there. And what's even more astounding is how much money is spent. So 2012, 371 million was spent in, this is the hospital discharge billing data that we have access to. So huge, huge amounts of resources being spent on, on hepatitis C in Kentucky. And this just brings the same uh, vulnerability assessment to Kentucky. And so we have 54 counties that came out positive for uh, likelihood of having the same kind of HIV, HCV epidemic they had in Austin, Indiana. Um, and you'll notice that most of those counties are over in the east in the Appalachian area. And of course, that extends down to Tennessee, as Carolyn noted, and up into West Virginia and even up into Pennsylvania. So, 
So this is uh, one of the other really alarming things is we're seeing a lot of perinatal hepatitis C now. And this is just, we had a period of time where we got some CDC funding from December of uh, 2013 to February of 2015 where we just encouraged, uh, the, we had I think 33 health departments that were reporting to us any cases of mothers that were pregnant mothers or pregnant women, mothers who had just had a baby or were pregnant, who were hepatitis C positive. You see there was 894 women identified, that's uh, right there. And um, uh, of those, there was a few, there was 28, there's 26 here that, that didn't have any results and one each that were in those other categories that weren't, which shouldn't have been counted, but they had hepatitis written somewhere on the record, hepatitis C, but it turned out they didn't actually have any lab evidence of that, so, so uh, a, few, a few less than 894. But of the children that were identified, you see there's only 263 right there. Um, that's because a lot of these uh, mothers were identified after they had their baby and the, and the children were never get, gotten into the system. So there's only 263 children identified, uh, plus the 21 that were greater than 18 months old. The, the really important fact here, though, is notice that of, of those, 212 had no results. So, so they were never tested after, and of course they weren't tested at birth, but we never got results later on to find out if they were hepatitis C positive or not. So that's, that's fairly alarming to me. <laughs> So um, this is births to women who are hepatitis C positive. It shouldn't say perinatal HCV rates. It's actually the births to women who are HCV positive. And so you see that once again is centering over in eastern Kentucky in the Appalachia area and then some up in northern Kentucky. And, and for those who don't know, these, these counties up here, Boone, Kenton, and Campbell are right across the river from Cincinnati. That's really the greater Cincinnati area. So that's part of that metropolitan area. So. We've been working on this for a little while, especially since Austin, Indiana, because we have some direct connections. Louisville's about 35 miles from Austin, and Hazard, Kentucky, is a community in southeast Kentucky that actually has direct connections with Austin. A bunch of families moved from Hazard up to Austin back in the 1940s, I believe, or maybe even earlier, and they still have family connections. And Austin, when they map the dense drug user network, is very, very similar to the drug user network in Hazard, and there are people going back and forth. So we were very concerned we're gonna see the same kind of HIV explosion in, in Hazard that, we're already, that we've seen up in Austin. We already have the hepatitis C epidemic there in spades, so, so we were very concerned, so we started trying to uh, implement some initiatives. Um, uh, we got syringe exchange passed in 2015, but it does require that uh, three levels of approval for any syringe exchange. It's got to be the local health department, Board of Health has to approve it, and then the county has to approve it, and then the jurisdiction, like the city that is going to host it, has to approve. So it's got to go through three levels of approval. And so we have, as of this date, 16 operating syringe exchange programs in Kentucky. Um, another thing that we did was in 2015, we mandated reporting of all HCV positive women, pregnant women, and all babies born to HCV positive women. I don't have the data on that because we have a stack about this big of data that's been turned in and nobody to enter the data. So we're actually getting a student to start working on that pretty soon here, but we just don't have personnel to do that. Um, we expanded hepatitis C testing to all local health departments. That was never available before 2016. Uh, HIV testing, of course, has always been out there. There was funding for that, but hepatitis C, there was not funding for that. And so we've, done, we've gotten that out there so our state health department can provide that, or our state lab can provide that testing. And then, uh, we are expanding our, our testing, as I noted in one of the comments yesterday, uh, to all lab reports for any hepatitis positive, I mean, any hepatitis test, B or C, whether it's positive or negative, so we should be pulling all that data in. Now, as was noted yesterday, that's not enough, really, but that's all we're going to start with right now, and we'll move into the next phase after we get that going. That's not even started yet. That ma that's mandated to start October 1st. And then in uh, mid-2015, we started an effort down in Hazard, Kentucky, in southeast Kentucky, to really target the high-risk populations for testing there and to really use an integrated approach to this. So, so we are reaching out to... Um, uh, jails to substance abuse treatment centers, uh, methadone clinics. Uh, there's a church that sees a lot of folks that come in for food on a t twice a week basis, things like that. And so we're offering hepatitis C and HIV testing in a lot of those places and uh, trying to get people access to health care coverage, access to health care, um, substance abuse treatment, any other things that they need to get them integrated into that system and, and identify those people so that we can actually uh, progress on trying to help them. So challenges. So we've got a lot of challenges. This is our uh, number of tests performed between January 16 and July 16th of this year from our, from our state lab. And you can see the number is going up dramatically. And I noticed on the APHL talk we were seeing the, the rates kind of going down a little bit for national testing for HIV, HIV, or HCV in state labs. In Kentucky it's going the opposite direction. I think because we've opened it up in our local health departments for testing. So now we're getting a lot more tests in. So, so when I put that little information about costs that I talked about yesterday. So um, just in that 
half year, we've spent 107,000 just on the number of tests we've done. Um, that's a total of, uh, let me see, I wrote it down here just so I could have it. Um, that's a total of 1,417 tests and 131 positives, so that 21,000 confirmation is what the 131 positives went on to cost to get, to get confirmed. So, so um, costs are going up because the number of tests are going up, and, and we don't have any funds directly associated for lab testing for HCV. So we had a little bit that we pulled from some other funds, but that's already run out and they're just using general funds right now. So um, one thing is that moving confirmation in-house, because we, cause we um, moved that out to uh, LabCorp, if we moved it in-house, that would probably reduce the cost substantially. We're not uh, uh, proved to do that, so that's one thing that would be good. And it would also save us a lot of time and effort, so that's one thing. I've got a couple of challenges slides. Uh, inadequate funding, of course, for surveillance, prevention, and control activities. Um, hepatitis C is the greatest infectious disease issue we have in Kentucky, period, bar none. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a massive epidemic. We don't even deal with outbreaks of hepatitis C because there's so much hepatitis C out there. There's no way to really differentiate an outbreak from all the other stuff that's going on very easily. So uh, we, only have, we only have one viral hepatitis coordinator that's about 92% funded by CDC. That's, that's all the money we've got. The state doesn't uh, provide any funds for hepatitis, although that may be changing. The governor's been noticing what's going on, I think. We don't have any specified funds to the local health departments. We use some money for the testing end of it, so we're, so we're trying to get that covered. And we're trying to leverage the other funds. Of course, we've talked about it before. The HIV has some funding available. Unfortunately, uh, their funding is going down too, and so a lot of that's already committed. And, and uh, so we did buy some rapid tests, but haven't been able to do much more with that funding. So we definitely don't have enough funds to tackle the problems that we've got with hepatitis C. Um, one of the other challenges that we face in Kentucky is that the current national strategies and the funding are not really targeted to what we need in Kentucky. So, so we're focused CDC strategy, no, no offense, John, the CDC strategy on baby boomers and HIV, HCV, co-infection and minority populations and STDs and tattoos and MSM. Our, our, uh, if you look at this uh, Louisville Metro bullet at the bottom, so that's their syringe exchange program that was begun on June of last year. They've seen 4,300 clients, the average age is 33, they're 63% male, sexually or sexual orientation 91% straight, 93% white, 98% non-Hispanic, and they've actually got a very good high positivity rate in their testing, which is, which is great. But that's um, the kind of clientele we're seeing in the substance abuse population. It's not any of these other groups that you'd expect to see hepatitis C in, and we're not seeing a lot of hepatitis C HIV co-infection in Kentucky yet. We may get that, but it's not there yet. Um, so in that second bullet, the injection drug users are about 80% of our positives, but they're only about 20% of those being tested. So there's lots of people being tested by the strategies that we're following, but we're not catching the, the bulk of the people that really need to be tested. So some opportunities. Um, one thing I talked about yesterday was enabling, I've talked about half my talk already when I was asking questions, <laughs> enable online access to the reference, reference tab, lab results, that would be really helpful, or to have some other way to get to that data. Um, so we, we would recommend having some partnership between CDC and the labs to give states access. So we were told yesterday we could do that individually with CDC, so we'll probably pursue that. Uh, collaborate with national reference labs to create test protocols for effective diagnosis of acute and chronic viral hepatitis. I think a lot of times the clinicians are confused and they're not doing the right tests and we're not getting the right results, and so we, we don't end up really knowing what's out there very well. So, so how to make that more simple and, and effective in getting the testing done. It'd be really great if we had a virus, viral hepatitis panel for pregnant women because they really need to be tested for hepatitis C in Kentucky. That's not mandated, it's not part of a panel, it's not part of any standard protocol. So if we had a standard protocol to do that from CDC that said here's the way you should be proceeding, that would be great. Uh, enable funding for regional pilot projects. So there's some states, as you've noted, with the highest incidence and uh, it would be great if we had some set of funding that was regionally uh, mandated to, to focus on those areas where it's, where it's the worst problem that, that's comprehensive. It's not just focused on testing or focused on treatment, but focused on the whole spectrum. We've got, we've got a lot of issues to deal with here and they're very complex, so we need to tackle it in a holistic manner. So bigger opportunities. One thing we've wondered is why isn't hepatitis C a winnable battle at CDC? You know, Tom Frieden's got a lot of great winnable battles. I think this would be a great one to add to that. And I think we should have a national goal for elimination of hepatitis C. That's the World Health Organization has a national goal for that, and we do not have one. So I think that would be a great opportunity. It's humans are the only reservoir. We have lots of effective treatments now, which we didn't have a few years ago. 
we ought to move that direction. Um, of course, work with pharmaceutical companies to reduce the price of treatment dramatically. We can't afford to treat people when we find out they have hepatitis C. And then one big thing is the New York Technical Assistance Center has been defunded, and that was a huge resource for the hepatitis coordinators nationally. So if there's a way to get that refunded, that would be super. And I definitely want to acknowledge uh, Greg Lee gave me some of the slides, H Kathy Sanders uh, and Holly Sands gave me some of the information. Dr. Brawley is uh, responsible for a lot of the recommendations we're talking about. He thinks about this very deeply. So, and then Vanita Aurora from our lab gave, gave me the lab data that I was presenting. So, and that's what I got. I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. I uh, it, it's sort of, I, thank you for your talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, you know, uh, when one looks at the uh, emergency departments uh, and the, the, the studies that have been reported suggest that the prevalence of HCV infection is about 11.5 to 12 percent, yet the United States Prevention Services Task Force, uh, although they've said everybody between the ages of 15 and 65 should be tested for hepatitis C, uh, they gave it a grade B recommendation, which means that, it, according to CMS, it can only be reimbursed if it's a primary care setting, and a, an emergency department is considered a secondary uh, right. setting. And I was noticing, you know, uh, you know, your reports on 80 percent of the positives are drug users, only 20 percent are being tested. The people who come through the emergency departments are mostly on Medicaid or uninsured. And so, therefore, the emergency departments have trouble getting reimbursed. And probably, I suspect, a number of those are probably uh, injecting drug users. Uh, do you see this problem in uh, Kentucky? I guess it's really for every state. And uh, you know, what's the sense of what the Department of Health does there in terms of uh, reimbursement or even uh, dealing with CMS? Yeah, we've been working on those models on how to get that out there. Uh, we got a bigger problem than that. Um, so we went, <laughs> we went to a, we went to a hosp hospital system in eastern Kentucky. I won't name the system, and and met with their ER doctors and their hospital administration to say, you know, what do you guys do about hepatitis C? You've got this big epidemic going on, and we and we presented them with a lot of the data, and they were astounded. They they really weren't even aware that there was an epidemic of hepatitis C in their area, and they weren't doing any high risk screening in the ERs for their patients coming in. So if someone coming for a drug overdose, they treat them for the drug overdose, send them on their way. So they weren't even starting to do that testing. So we have started that in uh, Louisville and in these hospitals in Eastern Kentucky, they've started doing that. And they found models to pay for a lot of it. So they're, they are finding ways to get around it because one of the issues when the people come in, drug users are very unlikely to have health care coverage, but when they get in, they can get linked to that, you know, and, and up to this point, we've had a good system in Kentucky to, to make that available. So. so would you recommend that uh, the emergency departments do universal opt-out testing? Well, that's what, we're, that's what we're actually pushing to do that. Now, I don't think we're there yet in any stretch of the imagination, but we're talking to different hospital systems about doing that, yes. Yes, sir. Excuse me, Ryan Clary with the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable. So I just want to respond a little bit about the CMS issue because I've heard it a couple of times. The CMS ruling is specific only to Medicare. So if Medicaid, if any payers are not reimbursing in emergency rooms, outside of Medicare, that's a problem because the CMS ruling is specific only to Medicare. And it, the USPSTF grade says nothing about where the settings in which reimbursement should happen. So it's really a CMS determination. I'm sorry for taking a little of your no, that's great. time around that. But it's a huge issue that because hepatitis B is about to have the same ruling and it's also restricted to primary care. So it's a really big problem that I think we as a community should really figure out whether it's a congressional or administrative strategy to work on. No, thank you very much, because I'm not an expert in that area, but they, but they have figured out models to get that paid for through the different systems, so they're, they're not, not finding an answer to that. So, so yeah, we are, we are recommending universal opt-out testing if we can get everybody to accept that and move ahead with that, so. All right, oh, John. <laughs> Great overview. Um, uh, we collaborated recently on the report uh, describing the um, number of pregnant women with hepatitis C and uh, the risk for newborns. And I just wondered, it um, seems like, uh, I just was wondering how is, that, um, how is that problem being recognized in the state? Is there a sense of urgency and concern around that? Or um, what, uh, what, what, what's your feeling on that? That's good. There's a sense of urgency and concern in the health department. 
Um, I'm not getting the sense that we need, I, I, I will say, so we just had a governor change, we just had an administration change, and, and uh, we are getting more requests from legislators to ask about the situation, and it's gotten onto the radar, and so we're getting opportunities to go and talk about it and, and share that information. In fact, we got an opportunity with Rand Paul's office from the national level. Um, so um, I think the sense of urgency is growing rapidly. Um, what's, what's kind of supplanting the public health end of it, although it gets to it, is that substance abuse is really taking the forefront in a lot of the efforts right now. It's how do we prevent substance abuse? How do we stop people from getting on? And that rise in hepatitis C that I showed that graph, right in the middle of that is when we changed our law, so we really restricted prescription opioid abuse, didn't change the curve at all. People switched immediately over to other medications or heroin, and the rate just kept climbing, you know, so, so we we traded one thing to get another one, but um, yeah, so the perinatal is a real, that's one of my biggest concerns, because you're, you're st starting off a whole generation of kids that are gonna not have good outcomes, probably. <laughs> yeah, we just began to do some outreach with like the American Academy of Pediatrics, and I know, you know, the, I didn't know if the, like the state chapter of ACOG is, you probably, you know, provides opportunities to get the word out. Yeah, and actually our um, senior deputy commissioner now, Dr. Connie White, is an ACOG member. She's an OBGYN, and so, so we're working with her to try and interface with them to start making some good connections there. So. Then a point of clarification on your slides, tattoos are not a priority. Okay, good. I see, you see, just mean, <laughs> might want to scratch that I read, I read that somewhere when I was making that slide, so I stuck <laughs> it on there. So. Maybe it was when you were getting a tattoo. But <laughs> All right. All right, thanks very much. Good afternoon. I think that I am all that stands between you and your weekend. <laughs> so I will do my best to be, uh, to be brief and... Um, hopefully uh, not too dry, uh, since I know it's late in the day. Um, my name is Lisa Randall. I represent the National Alliance of State and Territorial Aids Directors, which is a national membership organization which represents the um, state health departments, uh, HIV, and viral hepatitis programs. And periodically, NASDAQ uh, goes through uh, rounds of fielding surveys to try to get a sense on what's going on out in the world. So. Um, we can have a, a position to develop technical assist assistance from and to, uh, to communicate and educate uh, not only uh, the federal agencies but uh, legislatures and to, uh, to help our, our members do the same. And so what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, today is a survey that we fielded last fall on it was HIV uh, testing and billing specifically but we took the opportunity to cram in a few questions about hepatitis C, and in particular, integration of HIV and hepatitis C programming. Many of our state health departments manage integrated programs, um, and so we wanted to get a sense on how those funds um, and how those activities um, were really being, uh, were being managed and, um, and how resources are leveraging each other. Do I push buttons or is it is it this thing? But this this page but down. page down. Yay! Mm -hmm. um, so this first slide here, the question that we asked of health departments was: So where where do you do HIV testing and where do you do hepatitis C testing? To what extent do those two things overlap? And you will note from this that, number one, the, the vast majority of health departments, uh, 42 state health departments specifically, do HIV and HCV testing in the same place, uh, physically located in the same place. Um, for a, a minority of those, for nine health departments, it's in uh, venues where it's selected venues, uh, or all venues, and then in others it's, it's certain mixes of venues, like substance abuse treatment centers. So there's a fair amount uh, of HCV testing occurring in the context of, of HIV programming. We also asked where HCV testing is being provided, what kinds of venues, and, and it shouldn't surprise you that um, traditional public health venues, community-based <laughs> organizations, um, STD clinics, family planning clinics, uh, substance abuse treatment centers uh, appeared with, with a high number of, of references. What uh, probably won't surprise you either is that the volume of tests in 214 for hepatitis C was 147,000, just a little over that, compared with two and a half million HIV tests, which was really interesting to, to us from the perspective that there's such an overlap in testing venues. So it seems that there's an opportunity there that we could further leverage 
those resources and those opportunities to expand hepatitis C testing. We also ask in these surveys, what kinds of strategies are you using? Are you using rapid testing or are you using laboratory testing? Are you using oral specimens? Are you using venipuncture? And so what we, what we learned from this last survey round um, is that um, many uh, health departments are um, using, have laboratory capacity. And, and from Dr. Gaynor, I, I stole a little bit from, from your survey. Um, and in fact, 32 state public health laboratories do hepatitis C testing, but only 14 state health department HIV and viral hepatitis programs require their funded programs to use those state public health laboratories. That seems like a missed opportunity to us as well. Part of that is related, I think, to the continued use um, of um, rapid testing for HIV, and as we saw earlier, hepatitis C testing with the availability of OraQuick. Uh, still about half of the HIV tests that are done in the publicly funded uh, settings are, are done using a point of care rapid test. We, uh, we assume that that uh, is, is mirrored by hepatitis C point of, test, uh, point of care testing. And so here's an opportunity here, I think, to um, leverage our existing public health laboratory capacity that uh, I think that we should, we should investigate a little bit more uh, deeply. Uh, related to that and related to some of the issues that both, uh, both Carolyn and, and Doug raised earlier is about the financing. And, and we've heard this, this is a theme with hepatitis C, it's the financing of, of the laboratory, of the programs, of the, of the medications. Um, we also know that about, I think, half of state public health laboratories can bill for something. They have the capacity to generate a bill to seek reimbursement. But only 11 state health departments are currently doing that for hepatitis C and for HIV. Here's another opportunity that we need to, to, uh, to look more closely at about how we can, we can change that. So there are a few key areas that, uh, that I think that we've identified through this survey and related, uh, related activities to, to sort of prosecute what, what, the, what the survey findings mean in terms of public health practice and in terms of, of where we need to go in the future. The first, I think, is, is that we have an opportunity and an obligation uh, to build public health laboratory capacity to provide HCV testing, including confirmatory or, or, or RNA testing. Part of that, I think, can be done through strengthening the partnership with the health department program. We've seen two examples here where there is a good relationship, a strong relationship and a communication between program and laboratory. That is not the case in every health department. Um, we also have an opportunity, I think, to further expand our ability to leverage revenue from third party, uh, from third party payers. Um, I, I, the caveat to that is I don't want us to overinvest in that as a solution to all of our financing problems because it, it, it's, it's more complex than I think that we, uh, we acknowledge. And certainly I think that there is a value in building PHL capacity to be able to do NAT testing. I think that we also have seen through the survey and, and through the conversations uh, here today uh, that we should uh, be looking to further leverage health department programmatic and policy infrastructure to be able to expand our reach with respect to hepatitis uh, C screening and linkage, which may include co-location uh, of services. One of the areas that we heard about yesterday and that we heard about also today as an opportunity for me is that to what extent are we really able to support um, hepatitis screening and linkage to treatment in substance abuse treatment settings. We all come from states where there's a lot of activity around opioid, uh, opioid epidemic, and there's a lot of money that's beginning to come into that. I want some. I want some for hepatitis C screening and linkage. I think there's an opportunity there because for years my experience has been is that substance abuse treatment facilities don't see that as their job. They didn't see it for HIV, they're not seeing it for HCV, you deal with that. And so I think that there's an opportunity there in terms of leveraging those programs. Never waste a crisis is something that I learned early in my career. There's a crisis that I think that, that we, can, we, can, uh, we can learn something from and, and gain something from. 
And I think also that we've, we've heard quite a bit uh, about the opportunities for building public health laboratory capacity to strengthen surveillance um, and for uh, working on um, building informatics capacity and epidemiologic capacity and using other data sources to help strengthen our surveillance capacity. And that isn't just for hepatitis C. We need to think about this in an integrated manner because there's not enough money in viral hepatitis, either at the federal level or the state money, to build the systems that we need to build. I'm going to change my hat just a little bit in, in, the, in my off hours. Uh, I, I also work with the state of Massachusetts uh, Department of Public Health uh, managing their Office of Healthcare Policy. What that is is just a sort of a fluffy title for I stick my thumbs in everywhere and make people uncomfortable by trying to get them to change the way that they do things. Uh, so just to tell you a little bit about um, Massachusetts, you've heard about this a million times, I'm sure. We have currently, uh, we think, 222,000 people living uh, in Massachusetts with hepatitis C. Uh, this, uh, we, we annually get about 9,000 uh, new case reports uh, of hepatitis C. Um, this, uh, this is 2014 data. I just uh, last night got um, unclear data from us, and we are over 9,100 cases for 2015. Uh, the distribution is about a third of these cases are, are under the age of 30, about half of those are female, and about 70% of, uh, of the under 30s are injecting drug users. So we have a very focused uh, problem in that sense for hepatitis C. Um, unlike Kentucky and um, uh, Mass uh, Tennessee, who are also long states, long and slender like this, we, we have a distributed epidemic. It's all over the state, uh, in rural areas as well as urban areas. If you are at risk for hepatitis C, or you have hepatitis C, Massachusetts ain't such a bad place to be. <laughs> we have enabling policy, which is really supportive of screening and linkage to care and high quality treatment. We have, since 2012, a statute that requires primary care providers to order an HCV test for anyone presenting to treatment. Periodically, I go out and speak with, with uh, audiences of clinicians, and I ask the question, so how many of you know about that statute? And in a room of, you know, 100, 150 clinicians, I might get two hands. Yes, we know about that. Cami, did you, do you know about it? I helped with it, yeah. You helped with it. <laughs> But you've probably had the same experience. It's the least sort of, there's no awareness of this. And so that's work that we have to do around that. We have reporting regulations which uh, allow us to collect negative test results after subsequent to positive test results. But our reporting regulations also have the, uh, give us the authority to collect on an ongoing basis other clinical information, including treatment, including clinical visits, including treatment completion. So that'll be really helpful for us in terms of constructing um, a, a care, uh, a, a continuum of cure uh, cascade. Syringe access, we have had a syringe services program since the beginning of time. Uh, we have just had a change in, in statute which allows us uh, to expand those. It had been capped at, at 10, uh, supported by uh, DPH. Uh, and now that is, uh, there is no cap on that, provided that the local board of health says, yes, go for it. And so we think that just since that statute changed um, in the last uh, couple of months, we've had an additional four or five, five communities express interest um, in uh, establishing syringe services programs. Um, treatment access. You've heard Massachusetts is the universal coverage state. 96.4% of every Massachusetts, of, of Massachusetts residents have health insurance. I want to be very clear that this does not translate into universal access or utilization. And this is a question I'll put back to, to, to Doug um, and um, uh, Carolyn, <laughs> it's late in the day. Um, to what extent do public health programs this is rhetorical right now, I'm going to answer it in a second. Um, fill the gap where even though people are insured, they are accessing services for hepatitis, either prevention or linkage, in places which they will not get those services reimbursed. They are not reimbursable. 
we in public health access populations and outreach to populations in places other than where they go to see their doc for the a sprained ankle or for, or for a cold. Typically those don't get reimbursed because of the rules of insurance companies. And so that's something that we're looking at and I'm curious to, to know what your experience is with that. Massachusetts is lousy with primary care. We have more primary care physicians in the state per capita than any other state in the country. But they're not paying attention to the statute and it takes months to get an appointment with them because we're a universal coverage state. So we have to create alternative points of access for populations that we're particularly concerned with. I'm very pleased to say that we basically have no treatment restrictions anymore. Mass Health, the state Medicaid program, never had them. There was no restrictions in terms of eligibility for treatment by fibrosis or uh, by substance use, um, active, uh, substance use. That is essentially gone now uh, for, uh, for all of the managed care organizations. And I think two of the three largest insurers, the last one will fall shortly. So we, we essentially have open access. Um, and we are in the process of expanding, um, as part of the opioid uh, epidemic, part of ex uh, expanding our medication assistance, assisted therapy and overdose and uh, naloxone <laughs> distribution. And so when the governor's office says, so what do you need to do around, around prevention? Naloxone distribution tends to be the first response. I want to figure out a way that we can get some of that because hepatitis C is, is going hand in hand with this epidemic and there's a lot of money, a lot more money going into this than can be spent on Narcan. Public health capacity uh, in Massachusetts, we have had uh, for a decade now integrated services for HIV, STD, TB, um, and, uh, and uh, STIs. And all of the prevention services are oriented around sexual and drug user health what that means is that every service contract that we execute says if you touch and feel a person, you assess their risk for all of these things and screen them for all of these things. And those specimens go to the state public health laboratory. We don't give them an out. We also implemented uh, third party billing in, in the state public health laboratory. Um, and so we have the ability now to, to bill third party insurers uh, for, uh, for those services. By policy, last April, we implemented co-testing for HIV and hepatitis C. We get one sample, we test it for both. Um, and surveillance, we are pretty, pretty rich in some regards and rich in terms of expertise, not money necessarily, uh, in terms of our ability to capture electronic, uh, electronically reported laboratory data, we have better than, we have almost every laboratory reporting electronically now. All of those data are pushed into our integrated inf informatics and case management system known as MAVEN. We have the ability for all of these service contracts uh, that I, I referenced earlier to connect all of the risk and demographic and uh, age data that's in there that's so often missing in laboratory reports with the data that goes into MAVEN for individuals who, who, uh, who are positive. Um, and as I said earlier, we have, uh, we have regulatory authority to be able to collect clinical data on an ongoing basis so that we can monitor engagement and treatment and completion and treatment. We're now in the process of building the uh, capacity to receive those data from EMRs electronically. Um, and we are also looking at medical claims data to try to get some sense on what's going on in the world outside of public health. Oops. Um, just to give you an idea of, of the integrated uh, screening programs, we do about 30,000 tests annually for HIV and hepatitis C now in the state public health laboratory. Um, and you can see in 2015 when we implemented um, the co-testing requirement, we had a huge jump in the number of antibody positives. Most of those uh, folks are injecting drug users, surprisingly, and most of our injecting drug users previous to that were not getting a hepatitis C test. And so we, we have uh, used this, just this policy change uh, to be able to greatly expand our reach for hepatitis C. So just, just to wrap up uh, with this, um, I like to think of public health surveillance program and laboratory as the three legs on a stool. And if one of those legs breaks, you fall on your bum and it hurts. 
If one of those legs is shorter than the other or somehow broken, you sit uncomfortably. So we want all of those legs to be strong uh, and even to the extent that that's, that's possible. So we have had a lot of successes in, in Massachusetts and some of the areas that I identified earlier as potential opportunities for public health overall, which is integrating services and leveraging contracts. Uh, and leveraging other public health uh, resources, both public health laboratory and public health programs. Um, and we have used that to uh, the ability to really expand access and utilization uh, of hepatitis C services. Where we need to go now, where our opportunities are, is we do not yet have NAT capacity in the state public health laboratory. And so it's, it's intensive for us, both from a surveillance perspective, to sort of link up the folks that were screened, antibody positive, in the state public health lab, uh, with, uh, to the extent that they were um, connected with care and received an, an RNA test. Um, and then effectively linked into care. That we're struggling with understanding how well that's happening now. We think it's about 60%, but we're just in the very beginning phases of being able to use these various sources of data to, to try to, to confirm that. But it would be tremendous for us in terms of being able to uh, understand our, our program effectiveness and understand um, the, uh, uh, the epidemic overall if we had that capacity in-house. That's all I have. Um, <laughs> you have questions about NASDAD. Chris Taylor is the senior uh, manager for hepatitis there. Otherwise, you're, you're welcome to contact me. Do we have a couple of minutes for questions? So we haven't started rolling out the HCV testing in health departments. We're hoping to do that um, November 1st, but we're going to be doing that per the um, guidelines, so baby boomers and also individuals with um, known risk factors. That being said, we also do have a huge concern about um, uh, reproductive age women who may not come forward with risk factors. Um, so we're using that pilot data to see who we might be missing and then perhaps um, uh, expand that. But where we do have um, experience with that is in our STD clinics. And although we haven't integrated hep B and hep C testing um, up until now, except for in those pilot sites, with HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis screening, we want to make sure, and so this, the same approach would apply for hep C, but that there's not a barrier for somebody who wants to get tested or has symptoms or certainly a contact who's been named or whatever. So our approach to billing, and we do have billing capacity in our health departments, our approach is ask them if they've got insurance. Um, if they do, then obviously collect that information and bill for it. If they don't, um, or they say they don't, there's not a vetting process. There's not a, a of course, with our Ryan White program, there is a strong vetting progress process, but in our health department STD clinics, there's not. So if they say they're not, because it might be the EOB that they don't want to have, and that's why they're coming to a health department in order to get a non-claimed test. So then we ask for a sliding scale, but if they can't provide the money that's asked for on the sliding scale, we still give them the testing because uh, that's, we're public health and um, that's what we're trying to do. So I guess I would ask you, just throw it back to you in your health department. I've, obviously, we're not a Medicaid expansion state. You guys are like near universal coverage, so it's different. But in Massachusetts, how have you been able to integrate hep B and hep C testing into your STD clinic? Are you requiring billing on everybody? Or if not, so therefore they're getting their EOBs. Yeah, we don't have STD clinics. Okay. Uh, to begin with, but in our, our publicly uh, funded sites, we did mandate that insurance information is collected. But what we have seen is, is two things. Is once we implemented that mandate, is that folks suddenly mysteriously became non-insured. No, we don't have insurance. I think for these, these reasons. 
Um, so our, our rate of uninsured population uh, w went way up. The other thing that we found is because uh, individuals are seeking these services at places other than their medical home, for example. Um, they don't have that information, they don't want to share that information, and we can't get it reimbursed because that service didn't happen in the context of the right kind of visit at the right place. So how are you paying for the 